for given and for giving. What I propose to do is to begin with our reading from the epistles. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 to 5, 2, that we just heard. The Apostle Paul covers a lot of ground in this section, but it, it's possible to identify an underlying theme. We will then go to the Old Testament and gospel readings to look at illustrations of how this teaching works in practice. We've been looking at, sorry. We've been looking at selections from the letter to the Ephesians for several weeks now, and know that the letter divides up into two. Chapters one to three provides the theological framework. And in chapters four to six, he explains how what he has been saying works out in everyday life. Here in chapter four, verse 25 to 5, 2, he applies to everyday living what he has been saying in the earlier verses, verses 17 to 24. Namely, that those who have come to believe in the Lord Jesus begin to be renewed in their thinking, becoming conformed to the truth as it is in Jesus. Verse 21. In this entire passage, that is 425 to 52, the apostle deals with relationships in the Christian community. He begins by pointing out that the renewal in one's way of thinking that he has referred to in the previous verses is reflected in one's attitude to the truth. Lying to one another disrupts unity by creating conflicts and destroying trust. It tears down relationships that can lead to, to deep animosity, even in the Christian community. He then refers to the damage that uncontrolled anger can cause in a family or the wider community. Paul doesn't say that all anger is wrong, but he insists that it's important to handle our anger properly. If vented thoughtlessly, anger can hurt others and destroy relationships. If it is bottled up inside, it can cause us to become bitter and destroy us from within. Paul tells us that to deal with our anger immediately in a way that builds relationships rather than destroys them. If we nurse our anger, we will give the devil an opportunity to divide us. He then urges his readers to work honestly so that they can support themselves and perhaps meet the need of others. Sincere labor is not only the will of God for mankind, that is, Adam worked in the Garden of Eden before sin came, but a way to share with those in need. Believers are stewards of what we have. We're not owners. Then in the remaining verses in chapter 4 and going on into chapter 5, he turns to the important subject of our speech. He warns against corrupting talk and encourages his readers to seek to build up and give grace to those around us. The term corrupting literally was used of something rotten or crumbling stonework. It came to be used metaphorically of something that is corrupt or de depraved, vicious, foul, or impure. On the other hand, God-given God spiritual gifts, including edifying speech, edify the whole body. They build up the body. Believers must live, give, and minister for the good of the body of Christ, that is the church, not for themselves. Again, the corporate subject of biblical faith is emphasized above individual freedom. We can grieve the Holy Spirit by the way we live. Paul warns us against unwholesome language. 
bitterness, improper use of anger, brawling, slander, and bad attitudes towards others. Instead of acting that way, he says, we should be forgiving just as God has forgiven us. And in love towards others, just as God acted in love by sending his son to die for our sins. This is Christ's law of forgiveness as taught in the Gospels. We also see it in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. God forgives us not because we forgive others, but solely because of his great mercy. And we come to understand his mercy, however, as we come to understand his mercy, however, we will want to be like him. Having received forgiveness, we will pass it on to others. Those who are un unwilling to forgive have not become one with Christ, who is willing to forgive even those who crucified him. Just as children imitate their parents, we should follow God's example by imitating Christ. His great love for us led him to sacrifice himself so that we might live. Our love for others should be of the same kind, a love that goes beyond affection to self-sacrificing sacrifice, uh, service. Now let us look at our other two readings. The fact that we can link passages like this underlines the essential unity of the Bible. Yes, we do have 36, 66 books. And yes, we do have two testaments. But all 66 books constitute the revelation of the one true God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not surprising that we have an underlying unity in the biblical message. So we turn to our reading from the Old Testament, from 2 Samuel chapter 18. It's a very touching narrative. But to fully appreciate it, we need to pay attention to its context in the book of 2 Samuel. Last week, we looked at how the prophet Nathan confronted King David regarding Bathsheba and Uriah. David was contrite and confessed that he had sinned grievously. And Nathan assured him of God's forgiveness. But he also warned David that he would have to face the consequences of his actions. Bathsheba's infant would die and there would be rebellion in his own family. In the very next chapter, we read about that rebellion in David's family. It's a sad story of sin and violent reaction within the family. And the narrative revolves around one of David's sons, Absalom, actually his oldest son. Now we read in chapter 14, verses 25 and 26, that Absalom was an exceptionally handsome young man, but he was a major headache for the king. The narrative reveals that the king loved him as his oldest son very much. And perhaps that was why he condoned the man's violent behavior. But it is also apparent that Absalom shunned his father's overtures towards him. Eventually, Absalom conspired against David, and David had to flee from Jerusalem. Absalom entered Jerusalem with the intention of establishing himself as king in his father's place. This eventually led to a fierce battle between the forces of Absalom and those of David. We saw last week that there was a very sincere and humble side to David's character. And we now see that he was also a tender and forgiving person. In spite of all that Absalom had done, David pleaded with Joab, is the commander of his troops, to do what he could to ensure that Absalom was not harmed in the fighting. Joab 
had other ideas, however, for he believed that Absalom had to die. There could be only one king. And when the chancel rose, he and his officers killed Absalom. However, when the news was given to David, he was extremely upset. He wept inconsolably and said, Oh, my son, Absalom, would that I had died instead of you. Now, why was David so upset over the death of his rebel son, ungrateful child? Possibly, possible reasons would be, first of all, that David realized that he was in part responsible for Absalom's death. Nathan the prophet had said that because David had killed Uriah, his own sons would rebel against him. Secondly, David was angry with Joab and his officers for killing Absalom against his wishes. And thirdly, though David truly loved his son, even though Absalom did nothing to deserve his love. But let us now turn, sorry. Now we may say that it would have been kinder for David to have dealt with Absalom and his bloated ego when he was younger. But David's reaction is quite extraordinary and his love also was extraordinary. We may play this down and say that he was after all his father. But as we read to Samuel, it is very difficult to find any good reason for David to love this ungrateful and egoistic son of his. The only feasible explanation is that David loved Absalom so much that he was willing to forgive him no matter how badly he acted. And I want to pose a question. Is it unreasonable to believe that David has such a sense of regret over his own misbehavior and a sense of having been forgiven by God that he was willing to forgive the misbehavior of his son Absalom. If we read Psalm 51, it is not difficult to believe that that is indeed the best way to explain David's love for Absalom. But let us now turn to the gospel reading, which is one of Jesus' parables. The parable was told to elaborate Jesus' response to a question from Simon Peter. How often will my brother sin against me and I have to forgive him? In chapter 18, verse 21 of Matthew. The rabbis taught that people should forgive those who offend them, but only three times. So Peter was probably trying to be especially generous and asked Jesus if seven, the perfect number, seven times would be enough. But Jesus answered 70 times seven or 77 times. There's a textual difference, we're not quite sure. Clearly implying that we shouldn't even keep track of how many times we forgive someone. We should always forgive those who are repentant, truly repentant, no matter how many times they ask. Now in the parable, a person who served the king and owed him a large, a, a large amount of money pleaded for the debt to be waived and the master did precisely that. However, that same servant, when dealing with a fellow servant who owed him a small amount of money and requested him to waive it, showed no mercy at all, but had him put in prison. We must believe, we must remember that in biblical times, serious consequences awaited those who could not pay their debts. A person lending money could seize the borrower who couldn't pay and force him or his family to work until the debt was paid. 
the debtor would also be thrown into prison or his family could be sold into slavery to help pay off the debt. It was hoped that the debtor while in prison would sell off his land holdings or that relatives would pay the debt. If not, the debtor could remain in prison for life. When his fellow servants saw what had happened in the parable, they reported the matter to the king who called the servant in and reprimanded him. Should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And with that, he withdrew the waiver of the servant's debt. It's not difficult to see that Paul's teaching in our reading from Ephesians stands squarely on Jesus' teaching here in this parable and elsewhere in the Gospels. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And then added significantly, so that you may be children of your Father who is in heaven. We who name the name of Christ and who claim to be adopted sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father need to keep in mind that we are forgiven sinners who are called to reflect that forgiveness in our relationship with others. We are forgiven and we are called to be forgiving. It is not easy, but that is the standard that the Lord Jesus has set. Let us ask God for the grace to meet that standard in our everyday lives. Amen. Sheila? Just a minute, Dr. Wendell.